and Jaffa's orange rows Microchips of sus, iPhone cameras bus Taco salads us, both on my bones us Olive Garden us, white Foster us Sabra Hamas, as far as sus Hello, and welcome to Bad Hasbara, the most moral podcast in the world. Of all the podcasts that exist in the world, we have the most morality. That's right. Uh, And it is I, your most moral host, Matt Lieb. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Bad Hasbara. What is Hasbara, you ask yourself, if this is your first time listening. Uh, It is the, loosely, the uh, Hebrew word for explaining. It's, it explains, and uh, it is also, uh, mostly just means the, uh, uh, the Israeli attempt to spin all the news narratives in their favor. It is propaganda, and we got a lot of propaganda to talk about, but first, I'm gonna do some propaganda for my own benefit, um, first things first, about eight and a half inches. Just kidding. Sorry. Um, come to the Sacramento Punchline. Uh, I'm going to be there with my wife, Francesca Fiorentini, Sunday, March 17th at 7 p.m. There's a link in the description. Click it and then come. Please buy tickets. Tell your friends who are in the Sacramento area to come. Uh, secondly, Patreon.com slash BadHasBara. Support this podcast. It is uh, demonetized for now. Maybe it'll stop being demonetized once we stop uh, doing copyright infringement. But until then, please. I mean, even after then, please. Uh, d- d- support the, the you know, Patreon. Patreon.com slash BadHasBara. And finally, last things last, uh, shout out to our brand new, or not brand new, but uh, now paid producer uh adam levin uh who is here um you know this is becoming a more and more of a uh, you know what do you call it professional podcast uh and we have a producer and i want to thank adam adam's gonna be here just making sure everything goes smoothly and stuff like that and again that's why we need you to join the patreon patreon.com slash bad also please listen to the podcast don't watch me i can't make money um sorry for yelling but YouTube is an impossible game. Okay, first things first, I'm going to bring in the second most moral host of this podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, Daniel Mate is back. What's up, buddy? Oh, hi. Sorry, I was just thinking about those eight and a half inches. I mean, listen, but that's fully, you know, bricked up. Not when it's small. You know, not when it's tired. Whatever it takes. Best yeah, of times. True. It was the best yeah. of times. It was the <laughs> yeah. It was the, it, <laughs> it was, was the shortest worst times. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like that. How are you doing, buddy? Oh, we're off to a we're off to a, a cracking start here. I'm I'm yeah. all right, thank you. It's a it's a cold, blustery, sunny March day, early in the spring forward time oh, yeah. frame here in New York City. It's one of those days that wants to be spring, but but can't quite get winter out of its system. So yeah, physically not able to, but it looks good. You just can't go outside or else you'll freeze to death. Yeah. You can't go outside expecting a, a, a nice day with, you know, with blossoms and birds. It still feels pretty, pretty, pretty breezy. How Sounds, are you? Oh, uh, you know, I'm pretty good. It's, uh, it's LA. So the weather's pretty much always the same, um, mm-hmm. which is nice. Cause, uh, it makes you forget all problems and it makes you go oh sun's out nothing can be bad when sun is out so you know i have that going that's for great me. i mean that's why la is considered the happiest place on earth right there's like the that's right rates of, of of depression and self-hatred are just there's just no one there who's like hating life and no, no one's no ever one has ever moved drank to themselves Los to death and thought to themselves <laughs> life is meaningless i should die <laughs> no everyone comes here to live uh it's except if you're born and raised here like i was then you're just born and raised with the human condition of being like i want to die i hate the sun and uh and yeah there's no la for you to and there's no la for you to move to there's no la for me to move to unless i move to israel land of the free exactly (laughs) home of the brave um yes today 
I want to introduce our guest because we have a great guest today uh, with us for just the first hour, um, as if there's a second hour, We're with us for most of the podcast. Uh, a fantastic guest, uh, a guest. this is a uh, media critic, an AJ Plus presenter, and former co-worker of mine back when I used to work at AJ Plus. Ladies and gentlemen and everyone else, welcome Sana Sayed. Said, sorry. <laughs> Fuck. It's okay. It's okay. It's at least you didn't say Said the way everyone's like, oh, Edward Said, Sana Said. I'm like, no. Oh. <laughs> Matt, was so Matt, you I wrote it. You 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 said it wrong. I said it. You wrong. said it. You said it all wrong. Where were you when? Where was that fucking pun when I needed it at the beginning to get it in my brain? It's okay. You'll get it next time. Yeah. If yeah. you don't, that'll just be the bit. Yeah, that'll be the bit. So far, you know, that is a running gag of mine accidentally, is me not being able to pronounce my guest names. Ty, uh, Tyg's uh, video about that was hysterical. Your Irish, the Irish yes. guy. I'm yeah, going to meet him yeah. in a few weeks. I'm going, I'm going to, I'm going to Ireland. He's coming, he's going to come to my talk. But oh, uh, I was talking to him today and he made that hilarious video about watching Bad, bad Hasbara and his, you know, he's looking all happy that you're mentioning him. And then you and Fran do, do the American comedian thing of just butchering his name on purpose. And he, he looks so crestfallen. <laughs> we butchered his name. It's spelled Tadgaha. Okay? It is t- spelled Tadgaha. Yeah. It's not my fault that in Ireland they pronounce your names wrong or spell them wrong. Well, it's one of the two. All right. Sorry. But uh, Sana. Thank you so much for for coming on. Uh, I have been, I've known you for a long time. We worked uh, at AJ Plus together. Um, you, you're you're still there, is that right? Yes, I am. Nice. Almost That's... ten years strong. Almost ten years strong. Also, wanted to thank you so much for forcing me to think about eight and a half inches on the first day of Ramadan. <laughs> fantastic. Um, yep. fantastic. <laughs> it's like it's how I like to start the podcast out i like to let people know up top that this is um it's not exactly gonna be it you know if you're if you're here looking for uh journalism i can't i can't i can't do that for you but i can make a dick joke up top that's what i'm about. look man it's not called goody goody hasbara that's it's bad right. hasbara we're yes. bad here we're bad we Ooh. misbehave a little you know we like to get a little saucy a little yeah. spicy yeah, we're a spice podcast, <laughs> just <laughs> spicy Jews. Um, but uh, so you have been doing some what I would consider some of uh, the most standout work that I've seen uh, in the last few months regarding all of this, especially and specifically regarding the media critique. Um, you I, I have been my go-to account um, for uh, on Twitter for finding headlines that uh, completely misrepresent um, the actual story of what's going on uh, currently in Gaza or what's going on, um, I mean, anywhere, you know, in the West Bank and uh, in 48 as well. And just, uh, yeah, it's been it's been interesting to watch because I, I think I've seen more of a concerted effort on the media's uh, part to obscure and obfuscate the facts of what's happening for any given story. And I wanted to know um, when you are, do you look through it yourself? Is it, do you wake up in the morning, grab a cup of coffee and just start perusing the New York times? Uh, Bold of you to assume that I wake up and grab a cup of coffee as opposed to roll over, grab my phone and go, let's go. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So usually it's a mix of things. Um, I will wake up and I'll go through the headlines of all the major news organizations. Um, Also, usually my phone has blown up with people sending me things. So a lot of people, which is cool, people reach out to me and be like, hey, did you see this? Right. Before I even even. And and it's usually also a lot of people who are international who have uh, who've been awake before I am. And so they've already seen what's being published in the U.S. press. And so they'll be like, hey, check out this link. Check this out, et cetera. Or other journalists who themselves are unable because of the unfortunate conditions in their in their newsrooms to really speak out against their own newsrooms will reach mm-hmm. out to be like, hey, FYI, here's what's going on. Hey, FYI, et cetera. So it's, it's usually a mix of things. Um, and then, of course, like everyone else, I log on to Twitter and I'll see kind of a 
uh, maybe a particular headline has a already like a little bit of conversation brewing around it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then what I try to do is uh, when I can, when I have the capacity for it, is take that and also compare it to other headlines across, not just the New York Times, even though, you know, it was funny, I was telling my producer, I'm like, oh, we should just name our show like We Hate the New York Times. Yeah. <laughs> Point. Um, but um, instead, it's like, you know, I'll tr what I try to do is go across all the different uh, news or major news organizations in the United States, which is what I tend to focus on, even though there's no, you know, um, there's no like lack of similar headlines like in the UK and what, sure. or even Canada. Canada is far worse, believe it or not, than the United. If you think the US is bad, yeah, you, yeah, you know, you want to talk about it. Like Canada has been shocking. <laughs> As the resident Canadian in the house, I can confirm this, that there's a kind of default Canadian uh, dis dissociativeness. There's a kind of like the, the default trauma response of being a Canadian is to be somewhat disembodied anyway. And it comes mm -hmm. through in the language and you can see it in the you can hear it in the voices of commentators and news anchors. And the Canadian coverage is absolutely terrible. Plus, the Canadian Jewish community on the whole is even more dug in and inflexible than the American one. It it seems to me, you know. Wow, I mean, I have a question for you, as, Sana. You I mean? You, oh, sorry, go ahead, Matt. No, I was going to say, as an American, um, you know, from like uh, the country, the real America, um, not from yeah. Canada. Um, we look at Canada as kind of just like. Um, you know, it's like kind of our liberal neighbor to the north. They're like, you know, essentially communists. Uh, you guys are, you know, giving everyone free health care um, because you love Stalin. This is some Michael. This is some Michael Moore circa nine, uh, 2004 shit. Yeah, like this is not. And, and it but was played out by. Know, it was played out already by then. You know. Yeah. I mean, but listen, we 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 stuck to that narrative as far as we know. Um, Canada is the America that we all wished we had, you know, that's, uh, if you talk mm -hmm. to any like capital D Democrat liberal, they'll be like, why can't we be more like Canada? Well, yeah, it's a giant hard. bilingual bodega that sells insulin <laughs> for 50 cents a pop. Go ahead. <laughs> nice. I was going to say, what is interesting though, is that when it comes to Canada, I mean, a lot of the quote unquote alt-right movements in the United States, a lot of the kind of big figureheads, the names are Canadian, right? You look at someone like the founder of Proud Boys, Gavin McInnes, Canadian, mm -hmm. one of the founders of Vice from Canada as well. Jordan Peterson, Canadian. Right. Uh, the relationship between Rebel News in Canada and a lot of like here also, you know, white supremacist groups and like that relationship between the extreme right, even just the regular right, but like the extreme right, the extremely explicitly white supremacist groups in the United States and Canada, that's all coming. That's a, that's a Canadian export. That's what we're uh, doing. David like, from like, David okay. from too. David from, exactly. David from another example. Um, Man. so yeah, it's, uh, Canada is, it has, you know, again, it's, we have a really good PR, um, strategy, but uh, yeah. You so. guys have good Hasbara. We, we have good Hasbara, absolutely. Uh, Although hold on, I hold like on. What? Sana, did I call myself the resident Canadian not realizing that you're Canadian? Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. That's That that was fake news. Where are you from? Uh, so I have a weird story, but I grew up in Vancouver uh, somewhat. and then, I grew up between the U.S. and Canada, but Vancouver, yeah. Well, so did I. Hi, Vancouver. I know. And nice. somehow I didn't know this I about you. I apologize. When I say Vancouver, so let me get more. Do I want to get more specific on the internet? Uh, I'll say Surdell, if that makes sense to you. I used to deliver organic groceries for small potatoes, urban delivery out to Surdell. See, go. that's what I'm saying. Shit like that. Yeah. You, we don't do that in America. <laughs> we we no. don't deliver, you know, organic groceries to Surdell. No, we deliver guns to cartels. <laughs> <laughs> that just almost rhymed. Um, but yeah, uh, it, it's interesting because I, I also do see some of your coverage uh, regarding some of that Canadian Hasbara, that Canadian spin. And one of the most recent things was uh, Canada was uh, among uh, a handful of major countries, major uh economic powerhouses to uh, cut funding from UNRWA after the um, spurious allegations that uh, UNRWA is all Hamas, you know, that uh, was slowly but surely picked away by uh, actual reporters. Um, and uh, the Canada in, I think, an attempt to um, 
I, well, I'm not sure. You tell me. But Canada was one of the countries that recently resumed funding, and I saw a lot of uh, praise going its way for, um, you know, doing so. Uh, what are your thoughts on the reasonings uh, behind this and uh, whether or not uh, it is worthy of praise or, or not? I don't think there's anything worthy of praise in stopping funding of what is the longest running and almost only lifeline for millions of Palestinians uh, over completely un- uh, substantiated allegations before any semblance of an investigation could take place. So I give zero props to any country that's resuming um, uh, aid to UNRWA after having stopped it. Because the thing is, the damage is done too, mm-hmm. right? Um, we already have a horrific, uh, uh, you know, starvation that's been spreading across, especially North Gaza. Um, and we, we've been seeing children dying. There's several, like I mean, so many more children who are at risk of, of, of dying from starvation in the coming days and weeks. Um, so, but I think what happened here is that Canada, like a few of the other, like Sweden also, as soon as Sweden joined NATO, they're like, oh, and we're resuming, we're resuming aid back to UNRWA too. Right. But I think they saw as, I mean, that's what they said. Like they saw the UN report, right. Mm-hmm. Which was probably like, no guys, this is. <laughs> Because and, and of course now we've also heard the fact, surprise, surprise, the Israelis tortured a bunch of people and got confessions that way, right? Mm-hmm. So I think what Canada saw, as a, a few other countries, is what their liability was, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Especially as we know that this entire genocide is being, you know, discussed at the, and being looked at the international court level. Um, if I'm a Canadian you know, a uh, federal minister, and I see a report that very clearly says, uh, you know what, that those allegations were completely unfounded, ABCD, and it's coming from the United Nations, I would immediately think about what my li- my legal li- liability is in all of that. And I think that's what we saw there. I don't think it was some sort of change of moral heart. Um, I do think that, you know, the pressure on the Canadian government, maybe to an extent, but I think ultimately it came down to uh, a, a very cynical move, which is, what is our our role in all this? And also, it does align with how this story fell out of the news once it was completely taken apart, right? Yeah. Once we saw, like, who was, you know, th- when we saw, like, the, the it's that dossier, which when other news reporters were able to get a hand on it, they were like, there's, there's nothing in this dossier that actually says uh, right. what is being claimed here, right? right. So now it's not a story. No one's talking about UNRWA in that way at all. Even And like I said, the damage has been done. Right, and the damage. Well, this is I the trend. Is, yeah. Yes. Yeah. The damage uh, is that, or at least the entire purpose of it is uh, to exist as uh, a news cycle for just long enough to get a rapid yeah. response from allied countries, um, and then to when it's later proven to be false, uh, forget about it. We'll move on to something else. And, and honestly, it's similar but... with. No, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and honestly, like to me, out of all the stories that have been uh, manufactured since October 7th, the UNRWA one is one of the most blatant in terms of, we remember when that story dropped, right? It was literally about like an hour after Mm -hmm. the ICJ um, kind of preliminary ruling that came out. And all of a sudden, right, State Department's like, oh, uh, FYI, we're going to be defunding UNRWA because they're a bunch of terrorists. So, you know, yeah. by the way, no press conference today. Yeah. It was it, it was so transparent how it was done, why it was done. Um, and so to me, this story was the most, it's like the perfect example of a completely fabricated story that was placed specifically to remove any and all attention from what should have been a, uh, even though I know a lot of people myself included, we're not necessarily very happy with the ICJ preliminary ruling, but that should have been the story and within hours switched. Yeah. Do you feel like, uh, I mean, Canada has all kinds of pressure from various sides. So if they responded to a sense of, uh uh-oh, we could be on the hook here from within, that's one thing. But do you think at the same time, there was some back channeling to the United States to daddy to be like, um, sorry, but, uh, you know, we, we think we're going to back out on back out on this one. Uh, <laughs> and of course the, the U S would have been like, sure, do what the fuck you want. You did your job. You pulling out now is not going to kill the narrative. No one cares about you anyway. Fuck off. Like, do, but do you, do you think that they would have, they would have reversed course like that without 
checking in with the Godfather? Uh, first of all, loved hearing a Canadian story. Um, that is the one thing that gives me away every single time here, um, living yeah. in the United States. But yeah, absolutely. There was no way that the Canadian government um, would have made this decision without checking in with the Americans being like, hey guys, so what are you guys finding? Let us know um, because we think we're going to actually start refund. And also, not only did they uh, start the refunding, but they're like, we're going to give additional money. Right. Which is because they, like I said, they thought about their own necks in that moment. Definitely let the United States know. Also probably let Israel know too. Yeah. Like that's the thing. It's not just the United States. They probably let Israel know too. So, and wasn't there also like a U.S. intelligence, which I thought was really interesting how it was reported on. So the U.S. intelligence said they had low confidence about UNRWA involvement, about any UNRWA involvement, UNRWA employee involvement in October 7th. But the way I remember it being reported, and it was really quick, but people were like, the way, like news organizations were like, oh, U.S. intelligence has confidence <laughs> that that UNRWA uh, employees were involved. I was like, no, no, the report says low confidence. Um, but hey, yeah, it's become low a confidence. Issue. Low confidence is still confidence. That's right. Yes. Like I am very, very low I have very low confidence in my, uh, you know, uh, stamina in bed. I'm sorry. I don't know why I'm going back to dick jokes. I can't help it, guys. I yeah, can't. I have very, well, you have very low dignity. But that's that right. just means, but I that still just have means dignity. you have dignity. That's, that's right. That's all that means. Did you say dignity? Yeah, well, no. You should have said dignity. Not, I would never say that on Ramadan. Never. <laughs> that's right. Well, I just said thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so to continue with just some of the uh, the headlines, uh, one of um, I think one of the things that I saw uh, on your timeline especially was um, the uh, New York Times and other outlets uh, reaction to the uh, flower massacre that happened. Um, I don't know what was it like a few days ago. I, it's like at this point, I, I what is time anymore? Was it last week? feel like these massacres they keep replacing one another but um and it is it's interesting because i feel like one of the perspectives that we um don't hear from like you see a lot of people who post um you know uh, headlines that s feel either misleading or feel uh weirdly detached from the humanity of the thing they're talking about um but you're someone who works in a newsroom um, and so for you, uh, as someone who's a, a journalist and in the world of news, um, do you, uh, what are your like specific, um, like issues that you have with the way that they, uh, the, the media has been covering the war and specifically the flower massacre? What, what were, um, do you, do you remember offhand, like some of the issues you were having with it? Yeah, I'm, and this is, again, as you mentioned, this is something that's repeated, not unique to the Flower Massacre, but um, it is a lot of a lot of these organizations, but it's especially like the New York Times, right? And I don't want to keep beating on the New York Times. Actually, no, I do. But yeah, yeah, the New York Times, I think, excels in doing this, which is the verbal gymnastics to completely obscure and obfuscate any and all um, culpability of both the Americans and the Israelis, right? right? Actually, they'd probably blame the Americans before they'd blame the Israelis, to be completely honest. Like, yeah. to be completely honest, oh, yeah. the, way that, the way that the Times functions. And for me, what blew my mind was, I, I should pull it out. Are you, I'm sure you have it in front of you, but what was the original New York Times mm -hmm. um, uh, headline, which was something about, what was it? Uh, do you have it in front was of you? Was it the one with all the, I, well, the, the one I second, have in front of me, I'm not, as Hungry Gazans. As hungry Gazans crowd a convoy, comma, a crush of bodies, comma, Israeli gunshots, and a deadly toll. This is the quintessential. Is that the original one or the or the final one? I have. I'm I not even sure. Remember. I think that's. But e either way, it's the quintessential New York Times headline sentence structure, which is like, as something something happens, or in such and such a context, comma, and then just some kind of like poetically like understated thing like and and just a kind of like it, it has this hidden attitude of we're just looking at the world and kind of shaking our heads at it yeah 
One of the things that I have from uh, you was um, <clears throat> on uh, March 2nd, uh, one of the New York Times headlines was just lives ended in Gaza. And, uh, you know, since the war started, more than 30,000 people have been killed during Israel's bombardment and invasion. And here are some of their stories. And you pointed out that, like, there was uh, that even in their attempt to present Palestinians as humans, uh, the role and responsibility of Israel in 150 days of constant slaughter and starvation is muted and obfuscated. And it's like... For me, you know, I, I look at this and I see it as nothing less than an attempt to use the cover of, well, we're just doing unbiased journalism um, uh, to try to mute the, um, you know, the, the devastating language that would be applied to literally any other conflict. Um, yeah. Yeah. Plus that, they're using I sensitivity language like... People on, uh, online use things like unalived instead of right, killed, yes. which is the kind of language that drives me crazy. But I understand, like, if people are doing They're it for trying their own to get around protection, uh, like content moderation, this is that's also true. This these is guys the, are the moderators the paper of record. This is the <laughs> yes. paper of record. Yeah. I when I saw that lives ended in Gaza, like I want to rip my hair out, right? Because because here's a p, and I know from like the Times would probably probably say, look, we also humanize Palestinians. But it's like when the framing is like so like, what does that mean? Lives ended in Gaza. Like, what does that act? Because what we know what it means in terms of like, these are people who were killed by Israeli airstrikes, right? We know what that means, because we are able to look at the context of the coverage and all that. But lives ended. I mean, that's such a also that term also has like a very metaphorical meaning to it, right? Where it's like, oh, my life has ended in Gaza. I am now moving to Egypt because, my, you know, it, it could, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is a, like, a, like your life is actually like over. Like you're, yeah. you're killed. Yeah. Right? Uh, Gazans murdered. <laughs> you yeah. Gazans murdered. Or, you know, um, it, again, I think the, the greatest criminality, and I, and I don't use that word at all, like lightly, but I think the greatest journalistic criminality we have seen again and again and again and again since October 7th, but not obviously, it's not unique to since October 7th, it's the last five, five and a half months, but the greatest journalistic criminal criminality has been the complete removal of, again, any Israeli culpability in anything, right? And that, all, for instance, when we look at the starvation of, of Palestinians right now in Gaza, it's presented as though uh, Palestinians are just starving, that there is just this naturally occurring famine there, as opposed to, this is a policy. This is not only also an Israeli policy, but it's an American policy. You well, can't and, tell yeah. me that Joe Biden can't actually exert any pressure on Israel, an economy that is only sur surviving because of how much money the United States and yes. some European countries have pumped into it. In addition to all the military aid that's going in, you pull back a couple billion and watch how Netanyahu and his cabinet start going, oh, I don't know about this, yeah. right? <laughs> like, I, I refuse to, I also feel like that whole thing that the, that the, uh, this is like a bit of a tangent, but I feel like that whole narrative that the White House likes to push like every, every couple of weeks are like, oh, Biden, Biden just can't get to Netanyahu. Like Netanyahu is such a bully, and Biden's really trying. Like even yeah. that Mike moment, that hot mic moment after the state, it's also it plays into, and this is the part that gets me. It plays into anti-Semitic tropes, right? Mm, it's like, of course. It's like this one Jew sitting in Israel is mm -hmm. freaking out and controlling all of the United States government, and I'm like, yes. what yep. are we doing? Here? Yes, a hundred percent. And and this is something that I've you know pointed out. A bunch of times because it pisses me off so much uh, because it just it adds fuel to the it's almost it feels like a concerted effort on the part of um, the Biden campaign. Uh, if not just, you know, if it's not a concerted effort, it certainly is going to be the, uh, you know, unintended side effect is to further radicalize uh, people into anti-Semitic tropes. It's going to make it, because I, I, you know, when I point this out, I have people who are telling me, um, uh, no, no, Biden actually can't do anything because you know who's really in charge? Israel. As if Israel is not a client state. As if Israel's, uh, is, is not propped up 
if as if they are not uh, so fully supported by the United States in almost every single way that a state can be supported by superpower, uh, that people will invert the power dynamic to say um, that no, what's actually happening here is Israel controls everything. And right, or the alternative me, is APAC. Right. And, and, the, and, and which least, is which is even more which is even more sinister. Yes, and there's tr- and there's truth to it, but yes. it's like, come on, come on, bro. Like, take responsibility. Look, do the elders of Zion have me by the balls in my life? Absolutely. Does the sure, worldwide Jewish cabal keep me from doing the things I want, being nice to people? 100%. Do they, you know, absolutely? Do they, have, you know, am I completely on their? But I'm not going to go around blaming them for it. I'm going to own my cowardice. I'm going to own my weakness. You know what I'm saying? Like, I can't blame the Jewish conspiracy for everything. The, the yes. New York Times plays into this as well in, in the sickest way, the thing Sano was just talking about. And now I'm going to, this is a quote from my brother here, or a tweet that he t- mm-hmm. tweeted out, quoting, t- quoting a piece by Peter Baker and Michael Crowley in the New York Times. Mm-hmm. Is according to the Times, is Peter Baker and Michael Crowley, Biden is, quote, delivering death and life at the same time, unquote, in Gaza, quote, illustrating his elusive effort to find balance in an unbalanced Middle East war, end quote. They find that the U.S., quote, finds itself on both sides of the war, in a way, arming the Israelis while trying to care for those hurt as a result. It's astonishing. It, it is, it's so disgusting because it is a narrative that is, I think, very appealing, not just to like your standard issue Nazi, but it's appealing to the libs who will, who love more than anything to find a reason to defend Biden, any reason at all. That, that trying, Biden yes. has no power Whenever it comes to something that uh, he's, you know, I mean, literally, Biden has no power whenever there's something he can't get done. It's because he he doesn't have the power to do it, which includes, like, recently there was a tweet from Biden in which he said something like, no one should ever go to prison for for smoking just a little bit of, a little bit of reefers or whatever he said. Um, and it's like, you have the power to declassify uh, cannabis uh, in the scheduling, you could change the scheduling of it. He himself, unilaterally as president, could do this. This is not a question of going to Congress to see whether or not it's uh, to to make it legal or to decriminalize. This it is well within his power to number one not enforce any of the federal uh, drug laws against uh, weed, and number two to change the classification of the drug. He has the ability to do this, and it's the same thing in Israel. He has the ability to unilaterally not give the weapons that he did give unilaterally. He has the ability as president to do so much more than he's doing, but people pretend, including him, that he doesn't, and that feeds into anti-Semitism. Well, this also, is why I get... Go ahead, son. I was going to say, it's also mind-boggling to me. Actually, it's a mind-boggling, not really, but the fact that we do have other reporting that tells us that Biden himself does not give a shit about Palestinians, right? Yeah. We've heard Kamala Harris herself was quoted as saying, he's not listening to us. We've heard from other anonymous staffers. There was a lot of great reporting in the Huffington Post with uh, with uh, their their reporter, Akbar Ahmed Shahid, where he's been talking, like, does a lot of like anonymous like uh, sources within the State Department and White House. And they've said the fact that he won't even acknowledge the fact that Palestinians are suffering in private, he won't. Not only that, but we remember when when this genocide marked 100 days and he put out that statement, right? There was not a single mention of Palestinians at all, yeah. right? So the president himself, people around him have also said that this man does not care about Palestinian life. Like, And so it's it's when I said earlier that it's kind of mind boggling to me, it's just again, going back to what I was saying earlier, is that you have to, as a journalist, you have to go really out of your way to not talk about what is being shoved in your face. And that is why, you know, I'm like, we need to understand that the U.S. news media is not like, I know it's like, yes, free and fair press, et cetera, right? Or free press, but it's not. When, because there's something almost more unfree 
about a press that willingly does state propaganda yes. without any kind of duress. Yeah. yeah. And it, you know, and which is what the American press absolutely, and especially the New York Times yeah. has been doing. Yeah. Um, well, we're going to um, change the subject to something um, uh, more glamorous, you guys. We're gonna before we do, something. can I tell you, before oh, we do, can I tell you one quick Biden thing I learned the other day? Oh, yes. There's an extraordinary it. piece in the London Review of Books by an author from India named Pankaj Mishra called The Shoah After Gaza. It's very long. It's very complex. It's an incredible history of the uses of the Holocaust in relationship to Zionism and mm. It's it, it's stunning in terms of its breadth, but there's one incredible uh, anecdote in which he talks about, um, like he says, a strenuously willed affiliation with the Shoah, which is the Hebrew word for, for uh, the Nazi Holocaust, has also marked and diminished much American journalism about Israel. More consequentially, the secular political religion of the Shoah and the over-identification with Israel since the 1970s has fatally distorted the foreign policy of Israel's main sponsor, the U.S. In 1982, shortly before Ronald Reagan bluntly ordered Begin to cease his, quote, Holocaust, small h, in Lebanon. I didn't know Reagan used that term. Good for him. A young U.S. senator who revered Elie Wiesel as his great teacher met the Israeli prime minister. In Begin, Menachem Begin, the right-wingers, own mm -hmm. stunned account of the meeting. The senator, wait for it, commended the Israeli war effort and boasted that he would have gone further, even if it meant killing women and children. Begin himself was taken aback by the words of the future U.S. president, Joe Biden. No, sir, he insisted. According to our values, it is forbidden to hurt women and children, even in war. This is a yardstick of human civilization, not to hurt civilians. In other words, Menachem Begin, if this anecdote is correct, had to human rights explain to Joseph Robinette Biden in 1982. And that's wow. who is now pretending to give half a shit, a fraction of a fuck about Palestinian yeah. human rights, even as he's financing their liquidation and starvation. And if you know anything about um, Israel's 1982 invasion of Lebanon, you one the first thing that should stand out to you is of all of the Israeli aggressions slash wars to be in favor of a more aggressive action. That is the most insane one to be like, you guys should have done more death because that one is almost universally uh, looked back on even in Israel they're like yeah we were a little crazy on that one at least they used to now I'm sure they're like we should have done more they had Thank hundreds you. of thousands of people out in in the square in Tel Aviv protesting it and that's right too back when back when there was a peace movement in that country mm -hmm. uh, if you also look at and again this is a part that's so frustrating I mean there's a piece to be done here so ooh, maybe you know what I just got inspired maybe I'll do this piece yes. but it's actually looking at like Biden's history, even policy wise, right? Like if we look at um, US funding, military aid to Israel over the decades, right? Because a lot of people point to, well, after the 67 war is when American attitudes really changed towards Israel. And they were like, okay, we can use also Israel for um, uh, as a greater ally in the Cold War. So, yes, but the massive funding doesn't start until we start hitting the Obama years. That's right. And what was, a lot of people forget that not only was Joe Biden the vice president for, for, for uh, President Obama, but also the reason why he was picked was because Obama didn't have foreign policy experience. He was That's not a right. foreign policy guy. He was, he was, he was a pretty, you know, uh, didn't have that much experience and was, and all his experience was domestic. And Biden, for a very long time, has been kind of the 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 face of like U.S. foreign policy establishment, yes. right? And so it is not a coincidence that it could, even though the Obama um, presidency is always kind of depicted as the oh he was really standing up to Netanyahu, he wasn't. Netanyahu said himself that Obama, the Obama administration was great for Israel. As even Anthony Blinken, who was Deputy Secretary of State himself, had also said at uh, I think it was an AJC uh, conference, but. There's, it's no coincidence that that funding goes up when Joe Biden is vice president and it and that the fact that we have this genocide taking place when Joe Biden is president. 100%. And for any reporter to ignore this is, like I said, journalistically criminal. 
It is absolutely yeah. phenomenal. 100%. Yeah. Completely agree. And the other thing that I agree with is um, that it's time for a break. That's right. I have to remember to go to commercial break now uh, because if I don't, the commercials happen on the podcast randomly and then people yell at me. So stick around. We'll be right back. Let's hear what SodaStream has to say. Yeah, yeah. SodaStream. Uh, <laughs> so destructive. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to talk about some glitz and glamour. Today, our main topic is Trailglazer. That was the pun I came up with. Uh, this week, we had oh, one Oh, of... no. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just let me be me. No, no. I'm not sad about the pun. <laughs> I'm sad about his speech and the way he made it so easy for them to misquote him. Yes, yes. We'll Just get the, to that. The grammar of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But... Uh, so we had the most magical night in Hollywood just happened. The glitz, the glamour, the magic of the silver screen. Surely nothing could ruin such a, a wonderful night like this. Except for everyone who was trying to get to the red carpet. Um, they were met with uh, these protests right outside. This is uh, right outside the, uh, I believe, the Cinerama uh, Dome. Which, if you've ever been to it, uh, it's awesome and great. And, uh, you know, I'm... Oh, there we go. And, yeah. Um, and, yes, so they were protests outside. But in general, I think this was, like, one of those days where we all... You know, if you're someone who watches the Oscars, which I do, because it's, uh, you know, as someone who grew up here, it's kind of like a... It's like a national holiday. It's like everybody, you know, like, there's less traffic. Everyone's just at home watching all their favorite rich people get the statues. And um, in general, one of the reasons I was watching it was because I wanted to see if Hollywood, you know, in its history of being, you know, on the forefront of telling it like it is, you know, consequences be damned, if they were going to say anything about, um, you know, the ongoing, I don't know, genocide that's happening uh, in Gaza. And... Um, Apparently not. Uh, you know, there was not much that actually happened. I was watching. I was fairly disappointed. Um, there wait, were. Now, wait, I'm what? not going to sit here and let you erase one of the most important moments in Hollywood history with Mark Ruffalo walking that red carpet. That's right. And letting us know that he crossed the picket line, <laughs> but that humanity won. That's right. That is right. Listen, I appreciate. Um, the handful of celebrities like the Eilishes uh, and the um, uh, Rami, who's cool, uh, and uh, the Ruffalos and the Mahershalas, um, I appreciate something more than I appreciate nothing. And I, I will say some, you know, like, you know, Rami, I think, has done far more, um, you know, actually outspoken uh, advocacy for Palestine uh, than the people I listed. But at the same time, I do find it to be incredibly frustrating that the height of protest in this thing is a pin. And I want to give credit where credit is due, but the pin is so small. It's so tiny. Look, man, no, look, no, you wear that pin, you're going to ruffle a few fle uh, <laughs> ruffle a few feathers. I fucked that up. Oh, I know, it right but it there. was good. Oh, it was good. Ruffle a few feathers. 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 Really That's a good tongue twister. Yeah. Um, but it's a vague pin, too. Like, I, I I'm at that point where I'm like, we are five and a half yeah. months into this genocide. This is not simply. That's the pin. Like, yeah. That's the pin. Yeah, that's the pin. That's the pen. It is it is a, a red circle and then a slightly lighter red hand, and then in the middle of the hand is a heart. Which a black heart. A black heart. Doesn't really I mean it's basically a black square. What people start like we know. know that moment when that happened, right? Uh in in, in the summer of twenty twenty, when the black squareification happened of the BLM, like mm -hmm. everyone's like, all right, that's that's yeah. the liberalization of that. Like it was over, yeah. right? And it was co opted. Yeah. Oh, everyone did their part, we did a black square. I like I said, I'm Five and a half months into this genocide, like I, I'm gonna be an asshole about it, and I'm I like, know. and I, I don't, I don't think it's being an asshole about it, but no. so you know, if people see it, I don't care. 
But I'm like, we're five and a half months into this. This isn't like a far away genocide happening with the countries that you have nothing to do with. And you're like, oh, there's yeah. no, this country is overseeing this genocide. Yes. You as taxpayers, I as a taxpayer am paying for this genocide. Anything less than screaming at the top of my lungs about that this is a genocide that needs to fuck it, that needs to end, mm -hmm. like, is to me, um, it's just not good enough. Especially if you have positions of power. Because there are people, working class people, students, who are putting their lives, their futures, their careers on the line because they get it. Right. Yeah. They understand yep. what's at stake here yes. and what's happening. So when I see someone like Ruffalo or anyone else wearing a pin or being like, what? I'm like, I don't like, what do you want? What do you want me to do? Be like, good for you. You can't even say genocide. Like, what I do you know. want? Me I know it's, it's so hard because it's like, you know, I want to encourage it. I want people to not feel, uh, like, you know, they, um, like to not be so scared Th that uh, and feel like there's no incentive but it it also feels disgusting to have to incentivize being against a genocide like what do i have to do for you <laughs> like i have to rub your back no i'm glad if you do anything at all but also it's really not asking that much i think which is why while i was watching the awards uh once the awards started not much else was happening um oppenheimer Lost, uh, what was the other one called? L uh, uh, it was Oppenheimer. Poor Things. They won big at the Oscars. But the biggest winner of the night, the elephant in the room. Uh, that elephant took home most of the awards. Every single, every single, I think, winner went up there and talked about anything other than the ongoing genocide in Gaza, except for one. And this was the thing that is uh, swept across social media. Jonathan Glazer, the director of the now uh, Academy Award-winning uh, film, Best Foreign Film, um, a Holocaust film named Zone of Interest, a horrifying movie about the banality of evil. Uh, he, when he won his Oscar, he went on there, on the stage, uh, totally shaky. And I knew when he started shaking, I said, ah, this is going to be it. This is going to be it. Because, uh, you know, as someone who myself is a public speaker uh with like stand up and stuff the only time i shook more visibly in public was when i was doing a speech in public about uh you know how zionism is anti-semitism and racism and all that stuff so i knew he was going to say something because that's the look of someone who's about to say some shit that he knows is going to get a lot of his uh family yelling at him friends yelling at him and possibly hurt some opportunities do you know what else he directed oh hold i on, found out to have to oh, reflect no 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 uh, I know one other thing he directed, and it was so a I music went, video oh, yeah. for Virtual Insanity by Jamiroqua. Oh, that's that's amazing. So yeah. I went and saw The Zone of Interest. Yeah, the it's, the, the right. Zone of Interest is an incredible film. Of course, it made me yes. think of Gaza. It's brilliant. And as I was leaving the theater, I'm like, who well, who is this guy? Well, first of all, I thought he was German. He's English. Mm -hmm. He's Jewish. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he directed Sexy Beast with Ben Kingsley. Yes, yes. Yeah. No, you fucking won't. No, you fucking no, you won't. Fucking yes, you will. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. <laughs> so one of the yes, greatest. Yes, 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 yes. No. One, one of the greatest films in uh, the history of funny British accents, in my opinion. It is. It is. There's not enough Ben Kingsley in it, but yeah, quite a hell of a director, you know? Yes. And it's And Zone of Interest is wonderful. So let's see what he said. Yeah, here we go. All our choices were made to reflect and confront us in the present. Not to say, look what they did then, rather look what we do now. Our film shows where dehumanization leads at its worst. It shaped all of our past and present. Right now, we stand here as men who refute their Jewishness and the Holocaust being hijacked by an occupation which has led to conflict for so many innocent people. Whether the victims of October the... Whether the victims of October the 7th in Israel or the ongoing attack on Gaza, all the victims of this dehumanization, how do we resist? Now, the rest of the speech is, 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 is fine and great. Um, but this line that he says, and I'm going to read it um, because, uh, you know, who knows? I'll probably have to take out that speech because of a copyright strike. Um, but uh, this line that he says... Um, where the fuck did we I stand here as men who refute yes yes we stand here as men 
uh, who refute their Jewishness and the Holocaust. They being... refute their Jewishness yeah. and the Holocaust. <laughs> What? And the Holocaust being hijacked by an occupation which has led to conflict for so many innocent people, uh, whether victims of October the 7th in Israel or the ongoing attack on Gaza. Um, My kingdom for a copy editor. Come on, man. So here's the thing. When I saw this, um, I my first response was, hell yes. Um, and the reason it was hell yes is because, number one, he was the first person to go on there and directly talk, like, say the word Gaza, which yeah, I was good. like, beautiful. Um, yeah. But also, um, I think the point that he's making here of uh, we stand here as men who refute their Jewishness and the Holocaust being hijacked um, by an occupation is something that I think, you know, for me is like almost like the the, the premise of everything of me talking about uh, this other than obviously you know the the moral imperative is also uh, you know it's secondary to that but it's still pretty important to me which is that like this is a complete hijacking of Jewishness it's a complete hijacking of the Holocaust and the lessons of the Holocaust all to be used for the purpose of doing what I would consider a uh, classic Holocausty behavior um, and that is something that for me I was like that's a that's an incredibly powerful message um, on the other hand, uh, a, a little copy editing, a tiny bit, tiny, tiny bit, I think would have gone a long way because I did go, I had to listen to it a few times because <laughs> of the where he put the emphasis while he was saying it too. Yeah. And I was like, does he mean refute? Um, and then when I read it in a sentence, I said, oh, yes, we refute that our uh, Jewishness and the Holocaust is being... Um, if he had said that our, it would have changed the entire sentence. He used the gerund being. He says, we refute our Jewishness yes. and the Holocaust. That's a clause unto itself. Being, blah, blah, blah. Yes. It's a, there's, I, I'm not a grammar teacher, but a grammar teacher could absolutely pinpoint and say, well, that's an unclear English sentence. Sure. And, it, and, and it's in fact, it's the perfect unclarity to give to your enemies. I totally give him props for saying what he said. I'm glad he said it. 100%. It's just, and they would have fucking distorted it and been in bad faith about it no matter what he said even yes. if it said it perfectly i was just personally like so close yeah did you guys watch the gentleman behind them and you oh, see yeah. how he's like smiling and then as soon as he hurts refute jewish he's like, oh. yeah, like <laughs> the way his face completely like he's yeah. trying to control it but he's like what's that now yeah. Uh, yeah no i thought this was like i you know i have my own issue in terms of um like the kind of equivocation in terms sure. of, or the way that Palestinians are made into secondary victims right. in that as well, always after, uh, you know, Israeli victims of October 7th. But like, um, so I, I, I understand why that was done, but I kind of wish that being said, I do think it's very powerful. And I think that um, you, you, the, the strongest part of the statement is the context in which it comes, which is what yes. the film is about. Yes. Right. If this was just some other film, like if this was, Shrek 3, The Shrek Shrekening. Three. Yeah, absolutely. Shrek 3. Barbie. Or, or if it was Barbie or poor things and they just like, oh, oh, I mean, I guess that would be powerful maybe, but it's like, okay. But for someone who actually made this film about the banality of evil to then speak to people who are absolutely participating in that as well, right? Who are in the zone of interest, yeah. right? Like, that's the thing. They are, we all are, if you think about, right? We're yes. in the zone of interest, um, uh, which is why I wish... I wish the word genocide or something more had been used just because I think when we refuse to acknowledge what this country, this government here is doing, we keep ourselves purposely in that zone of interest as well. Yes. I understand why you didn't and I, I get it. But like, but um I, I thought with the context, it was it was incredible. Um one of um someone on Twitter pointed out that um at least of this more as of this morning, the Academy Awards had not put out their uh his um uh, speech. That put out yeah. almost every other single speech, but not his. Yeah, the 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 claim around that was something around um, like ABC gets first dibs for the clips, uh, and so therefore the Oscars uh, YouTube channel can't post it until you know thirty days or whatnot. But uh, it it all rings a bit hollow just because uh, you just. You see kind of like, I don't know. I mean, listen, that could be a perfectly cromulent explanation. But at the same time, I'm just like. Mm. The, cromul the cromulence for me is, is a little in question. Yes, sure. Uh, isn't, it, isn't it notable, though, that in the past few weeks, the biggest dust-ups, the thing that's 
inflamed the Hasbara industrial complex the most have been two award speeches at at move at 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 film festival or or award ceremonies yes. Sp- victory speeches by Jewish yes filmmakers one of whom is an Israeli that's right i mean it says everything and i know sana you do have to to go um but do you have any final thoughts on that i think the one thing that made me really sad actually was when i when i saw that speech was thinking about how we've yet, and I know Rami's been mentioned, but we've really yet to see powerful Muslim and Arab, yes. um, you know, individuals in the entertainment industry say it with their chest, Yeah. right? And to me, this kind of, it's a whole other conversation about representational politics and all that, right. because I'm not quite sure the point of accumulating any kind of power or proximity to power if it ends up being just more about self growth versus utilizing that power to actually, you know, hold power to account as well. So to me, like yeah. that, that just made me sad where yes, the most powerful speeches were even or call outs that we're seeing right now are coming from, from, from people who are Jewish, from filmmakers who are Jewish or people who have, again, who are in positions of power who are Jewish and, it just kind of breaks my heart a little because I also know that a lot of people are just afraid of like repercussions for their careers and whatnot. But it's, you know, in these moments, I'm like, there are things more important than a career. As well. You know, it's a perfect illustration of that. The limitations of representation politics, son, here you and I are two Canadians. We outnumber this guy on this podcast. <laughs> and you know what? It's probably an American team who's going to win the Stanley cup this year again. That's right. That's Maybe but the Canucks have a chance. We're doing all right, but. But yeah. but it's still going to be filled with Canadians and some some Russians and Swedes. I'll tell you this. That's true. Whatever happens, I promise not to watch it because I don't get it. <laughs> uh, Sana, where can where can people find your work? Uh, and and what's the name of uh, your series on AJ Plus? Uh, so you can find my work on Twitter, uh, Sana Saeed, S A E E D. Uh, also on Instagram, Sana Face. Very easy to remember. I actually have two series on AJ Plus. One which was literally created as a response to everything that's been going on. Mm-hmm. So it's called the Occupation Style Guide. It's primarily on Instagram and Twitter is where it primarily our audience uh, is. Uh, and then my main show is called Backspace, which is a media critique series that looks at uh, major news headlines in the United States and the, the kind of genesis of these of the way that these stories are told and how we can tell those stories a bit better as journalists. Hell yeah. Well, check them out. Uh, it, it's very good. And follow uh, Sana on Twitter because uh, you're one of my favorite follows. And uh, yeah, you're the homie. Also, I'm going to quickly say, I just want to say that, mm-hmm. Matt, you have been truly a breath of fresh air. <laughs> and we, I'm not kidding when I say a lot of my group chats are pretty much at this point just fan clubs of you. Oh, so, yeah. That's Everyone's nice. always like, Matt leaves the best. Oh my God. Yeah. Like literally every other day, we're like sharing your tweets. We're like, oh, Matt's so kick ass. Oh, that you're, makes me feel Amazing good. work. And thank you so much. And especially for like, using comedy in the way that you've been using it has mm. been really needed too. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, you know, tell, uh, tell the homies at AJ plus that, uh, me and Francesca have a baby now and you know, like, Hey, what about news broke coming back? Help I would, us. I would support that. I would support that. Honestly, I would support that in this moment. So that, that would be so sick. But uh, that, that really, honestly, that makes me feel great to hear. And I love all y'all. And tell the group chat what's up from me. I will. Oh my God, they're going to freak out. Hell yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thanks so much, guys. All right. Bye. Bye, bye. Sana. Um, Sana said, everyone, uh, to round out. What's up? What's up with me not being in their group chats? I was just thinking the same thing. I was just like, why, why oh. are they? Why did they create a group chat to erase me and 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 hate me? Honestly, I think it's a Canadian thing. I think sometimes people, when they find out someone's like Canadian and stuff, they're just like, oh, that's yeah. not. We're looking for an American. <laughs> I'm. I mean, believe me, this my people call me a self hating Jew. That's got nothing to do with it. It's the Canadian side that <laughs> that sparks the. You're a self hating Canadian. That's right. <laughs> uh. To finish up what happened with this uh, John Glazer uh, speech thing. Um, John Glaze? Yeah. uh, Mr. Glaze, glaze it up. uh, 420, glaze it. Um, We, uh, as soon as it happened, I feel like the Hasbara sphere went fucking insane. 
uh, like people were reacting. First, it was just a full on meltdown. Uh, yeah. We we had people just being mad online, which is my favorite is when they're just mad online. Uh, we had uh, this guy, uh, Avi Kaner, uh, or Connor, said, you hijacked the Oscars for your naive, selfish, vile narrative blaming uh, the victim. Uh, uh, Gaza was not occupied on October 7th. Yes, it was. <laughs> yeah, Hamas yes, it was. Butchered your brothers and sisters. Shame on you. Yeah, yes, it was. This idea that uh, that Gaza is not occupied uh, because in uh, 2005 they removed uh, settlers uh, is just complete horseshit. And, and, and moved the operation of the moved the operation of the prison to the perimeter of the prison. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it just uh, yeah, it just they just control literally uh, land, air, and sea, and uh, they control uh, everything. They can't. By the way. They, did you yeah. see the clips of the U.S. trucks coming through with concrete slabs to build this pier? Like oh. just a huge convoy of like, yes. just like truck after truck after truck after truck. I'm like, wow, man. Look wow. at that. Hamas is so, they're, they're so, uh, they're so evil. They'll, they'll let, they'll let concrete through, but not food. It must be, yeah. you know, Israel must be letting them do whatever they want and it's really just the palette you know yeah it's yeah that's right i mean if the concrete can and it can get in there certainly the food can um yeah no i mean clearly hamas is letting in the concrete so that they can chisel it into little rocks to throw that's right uh, that's uh that's what it's for um but yeah also by the way they they estimate uh that that pier that they're building uh for aid will take at least two months which um is means two months of starvation uh and that well is... especially if you have to and then you have to go through peer review <laughs> god damn you damn am you I... mate am i right damn you <laughs> am i right <laughs> <laughs> am i right as you cry i get no respect <laughs> no 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 it's just that the horribleness of my own pun makes me weep no, I know, uh, but I love the idea of the stand-up comedian who's just doing jokes <laughs> about <laughs> genocide, and he, every time he says, am I right, folks, tears are pouring from his eyes. <laughs> this guy knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> Where are you from? Uh, so, uh, yeah, th I mean, there was just like tweet after tweet. My favorite was uh, John Podhoritz, the lesser Podhoritz. Um, just tweeted, Jonathan Glazer, you can go fuck yourself and stump your Oscar up your ass. <laughs> like In that order? I mean, I assume he would, if he had a chance to edit it, he'd say, you can go fuck yourself with the Oscar. Right, 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 right. Something along those lines. But that uh, reminds me, that reminds me of a fantastic Jordan Peterson mm -hmm. tweet that I just have to find. Hold on a second. I'll go. <laughs> is I it, wait, is it the Elmo one? It's the Elmo one. Yeah. <laughs> it's the Elmo one. <laughs> Hold on. We got to find it because this is. Uh, I saw oh, this. Damn it. Teague, oh, uh, Teague, uh put it out. Where was it? It's on Twitter somewhere. Can someone find it? I'm, I'm going to find it because it is. Uh, so recently, um, uh, the account, uh, Elmo's official Twitter account, um, was uh, tweeting <laughs> out. Everyone, yes, tweeted out a Ramadan Mubarak to everyone, which is you know very nice and it's beautiful, uh, for you know, uh, all of the uh Muslim viewers of Sesame Street to get a nice yeah. Ramadan Mubarak from uh, la, la, from la, 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 Elmo, la, 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 Ramadan. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and of course, Jordan, <laughs> Jordan Peterson, uh said and oh, can i do my I best it. jordan i've got i've got a pretty good jordan impression can i do it? oh okay all right well i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna share this screen. so yeah. that uh so you can see it um and jordan peterson quote tweeted it with uh this right here <laughs> and he did it in one of his like free verse poems you know with like yeah. the line breaks yeah. so it's the <laughs> second hamas will never win <laughs> over the righteous keepers of the west up yours, scum. <laughs> and I thought to myself, up yours. Up Elmo's? Up Elmo's is the only way Elmo ever gets to speak. <laughs> That's right. That's the only it. time Elmo speaks is when someone's got it. Up Elmo's. Yay! <laughs> Just oh. the puppet thing. I couldn't, I couldn't. 
<laughs> Honestly, fantastic. And we're going to have to bring gum. We're going to have to bring back your impression. Um, we're going to have to find more Jordan Peterson content specifically for you well, to read. You're, you're going to have to find it and give me some time to lean into <laughs> the tears of the tears. Choked, choked rage <laughs> that come whenever I think about the good I'm doing in the world. <laughs> for the young men of the West. I love it because it sounds like uh, you're singing Rainbow Connection, but about how much you hate trans people. <laughs> That's this whole thing. Um, Why are there so many <laughs> tweets about pronouns? <laughs> and whether you're girls or guys. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there was a, a bunch of tweets, uh, but after a while of people just yelling and, you know, just wanting to do violence against uh, a Jewish man who just won an Academy Award for a Holocaust movie in which he mentioned the fact that the Holocaust is being hijacked. For in such a notoriously anti-Semitic, Jew-unfriendly town as Hollywood. Yes. Uh, I would uh, think this would be an inspiring story of overcoming the odds. That's right. That's right. But instead, uh, people freaked out, and they eventually they took a breath, and they said, okay, wait, 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 guys. We need to, let's put our heads together, and, you know, yeah. let's, we got to center ourselves, we got to focus, you know, people need us right now. They need us mm -hmm. to lie to them about what had happened. Yep. And so they did, and uh, what they found out was this angle, uh, perfectly put by uh, the uh, former liberal Zionist turned full-on Hezbollah and genocide apologist, Batya Unger Sargon. Oh. Um, sh she wrote, I simply cannot fathom the moral rot in someone's soul that leads them to win an award for a movie about the Holocaust and with the platform given to them to accept the award by saying we stand here as men who refute their Jewishness. You know where the lie is in that sentence? Um, that uh, she can't fathom, uh, well, I mean... No, it's the, the period. It's the period she put after Jewishness. Oh, she, yes. Oh, yes. If she'd that's been honest, one of the it would have been an ellipsis because yes. that's just not where the sentence ends. It's not even it, where the clause ends. We stand yes. here as men who refute their Jewishness and the Holocaust being used. And mm -hmm. we already criticized yes. the construction of that. But it, she's she's smart enough to know that that's oh, not they what all they know. Said. They yeah. all know and they all say it. I mean, Batya, the other lie there was that the kind of like implicit thing where she's imagining a soul. Like, I think she's just jealous because she sold hers a while ago. And yeah, so, fair enough. You know, she's just mad at anyone who still contains one. I mean, to her credit, I saw her on uh, System Update debating Glenn Greenwald and she's, she's, she's completely wrong on Gaza. But at the very least, she's not one of these conservatives who's like, calling for censorship on campuses she's telling jewish students to stop being whiny and, right yeah. and 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 you know she's calling out people like ben shapiro and these these fucking hypocrites who make fun of safe spaces for black mm -hmm. and trans people but now want safe spaces for Jewish. she's like no have the courage of your convictions if you're going to be an anti-snowflake don't be one yourself i respected that but this sure. is just this is just well, such Batya bush league is one of those bullshit. people Batya is one of those people who like uh came from I, I was first made aware of her when she was i think edit, editing the forward yeah and um i remember uh i mean she also may have written some stuff for tablet and whatnot mm -hmm. and i remember there was uh there was glimmers of this like there's two possibilities uh yeah. and we should do a whole episode on Batya because i think she's a perfect example of when liberal zionism turns into what it inevitably turns into look she uh, should have she could have gone the unger route or she could have gone the sargon route I yeah mean, <laughs> yeah we're seeing the eye of sargon now yes uh but instead uh yeah she went full uh apologist and and genocidal and uh so yeah she's got these glimmers of like you know um yeah, like her, I guess her past self, where she would just be like principal, yeah, the principal, right? But the thing about it is that in general, her entire thing is like lying, um, and she's yeah. she's someone who lies for <laughs> the purposes of the Israeli uh, war machine and state. So um, yeah, she wears the mug and David around her uh, around her neck like an amulet of like yes, of like that's what she's loyal to. She's loyal to that identity mm -hmm. and that country. Yes, and and 
and fuck any other sense of principle. Yeah, she just she she just uh, she kind of just uh, hates <laughs> she kind of just hates Jews. Is the thing with her just the way in which she uh, talks about uh, Jewish anti-Zionists? It just it comes from a place of being like just sick and tired of uh, Jews always being so complainy, which uh, is oh, we um, we got into this with Shmuley too, right? That's the right. Kind of it's, like yes, it, it's it's the classic Zionist self hatred of like. We need to stop being such victims. We need to yeah. turn our whining towards military might. Right. We, exactly. You know, we need. They we must need to fear us. They must fear our whining. Yes. Too um, long have the too long have the goyim <laughs> mocked our quetching. <laughs> they need to fear our quetching. Uh, yes. They need to fear our self pity and our yes. self obsession. They will tremble <laughs> in their unkosher boots when they hear us whining about how we're the victims of everything yes yeah no i mean it is it is really uh like it's you could draw a straight line in terms of that parallel which is funny because she did uh like back in 2012 an expose on um uh on shmuley uh that was very good um and kind of like uh pointed out his self-obsession and his kind of shaky past and uh you know his um mis misdealings uh and um fraud with uh you know stealing from the uh i think it was like the lachaim center or whatever something he created in england and whatever um and then he had them pay his his mortgage like re real real scumbag stuff uh to of life course. to life embezzle yeah. <laughs> embezzle embezzle my wife um <laughs> So, uh, yeah, everyone was, this is the thing that they latched onto was a complete misreading of this speech to talk about him refuting Jewishness and, um, you know, uh, and my favorite was, I was just like scrolling through all the people who were, uh, talking about this. And I found this one video where I was like, who the fuck is this guy? And it was turned out to be the executive director of stand with us. Um, oh. yeah. And I just, uh, I loved it because I love that the executive director of a very well-funded, um, Hasbara, uh, organization, this is like the video he made. I was like, don't you guys have like a team? Let me just play it for you. Jonathan Glazer, you stood at the Oscars and you said that you refute your Jewishness. Well, no, it doesn't work that way. Now I'm not ordained as a rabbi, but my understanding has always been that you can't refute your Jewishness. You could decide to be a Catholic priest tomorrow, but you'd still be a Jew. And just as I'm not a rabbi, I also don't speak on behalf of the Jewish people. But I believe the majority of Jews would say to you, Jonathan, we refute you. We refute your actions, which will encourage more record high, violent anti-Semitism. We refute your words, which will empower the Nazis of today, Hamas. <laughs> Just a close up on Hamas, <laughs> in case you didn't know who the Nazis of today were. Not the actual Nazis, well, like the ones who marched yeah. in Charlottesville. It's just like this fucking, this fucking guy, <sighs> it, like, how do you spend three full minutes on a premise that you just made up out of whole cloth? You know what I mean? Are you ready for some refute ball? Nice. Oh, Not I think really. we just. Not really. Oh, well, no, that was good. We stumbled on, at the very least, an episode title. Um, some refute, yeah, refute ball. Yes. Are you ready for refute Monday ball? night. It's Monday, Monday night refute ball. We're recording this. That's on the right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, at the, at the end of the day, I think my thoughts on this are uh, the speech was great, um, except for, you know, it was easily, um, <clears throat> I think, uh, misinterpreted. And, uh, but yeah, I don't I think Sana's right that it was too polite. I, I think, I mean, it was sure. it's great that it happened. I'll, I'm totally going to be generous and say yes to something happening and, and, and good for him. And, and he, he strikes me as a, a, a not a very, powerful speaker and sure. was nervous clearly you know but mm -hmm. i think just the, the lesson in it for all of us is half measures and half steps mm -hmm. in a moment like this are very very dangerous because yeah. if you don't come out with your full throat and just say it all of your effort to be measured all of your effort yeah, to, to be to be to thread nuanced, that needle yeah. To thread that needle just lets them grab the needle and poke your eye out. You and know? they're going to do that anyways. There and is they're no going to do that, that anyway. 
No, the, you're not going to escape never gonna the use, consequences by yes. being nice. Yes, you're never going to use the right words. Uh, the right words will uh, always elude you because there are no right words other than I stand with Israel uh, and there was, you know, a ceasefire on October 6th. Like there's, right. there's no correct words that include human rights uh, or empathy for the Palestinians. That's right. So you, so, so you got to do what Malcolm X said and make it plain. Yeah, you know, like just just plain uh, as if I was advising him, but it's tough. It's tough because he's got his own. I bet, I bet Mark Ruffalo when he got home last night to his wife and kids, they you know, sat down at the breakfast table. Maybe this morning was like, I want to tell you about something really courageous I did. You know, <laughs> see this. I pin? was walking the red. Uh, see this pin. This pin see costs this more than your car. <laughs> see this watch. <laughs> <laughs> Put that orange juice down. <laughs> orange juice is for Oscar winners only. <laughs> Um, no, but you know, he's like, you know, I, I was walking the red carpet and someone turned to me and I put a fist up and I said, humanity won. And I had my agent for the rest of that award ceremony blowing, you know, blowing up my phone, yeah. telling me, you know, you're never going to work in this town again mm -hmm. in, in March, yeah, you right. know, but I did, but I did it anyway. <laughs> I did it anyways. Yeah. I mean, like, that's the thing is it, 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 the, the amount of, Half measures that you see, you know, like, again, I'm someone who's who's desperately um, hopeful that the that there will be sort of a um, come to Moses moment uh, within the entertainment industry and community. And I mean, and the only reason I is purely selfish reasons, because I'm just like, listen, I would I would love it if. Uh, you know, um, I could continue doing the things that I have spent my career doing, uh, without, uh, hoping that, uh, without like worrying about every job that I'm not getting it because I'm an anti-Zionist. Um, yeah. but at the same time, you know, uh, I, I still am incredibly critical of the fact that like, you know, there's all these pussy half measures and it's like, you know, you're, you're, you're going around wearing a pin and you certainly, um, like that should be the lowest end. In fact, that should be something that I think should be in a, in a fair world that would have been mocked a long time ago. Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's the black square. We were it's the, when Clickhole had that. Are you taking the pledge? Do you remember that? Yeah. There was <laughs> no, no, I don't. What was that? It was it was it was in the it was in the aughts or the early two thousand and tens in the times of these you know sort of viral Facebook campaigns for nothing in specific, and it was like take the pledge, and you mm -hmm. watch this video of like. You know, young, fresh-faced young influencers be like, "I'm taking the pledge. Are you taking the pledge?" Yeah. This February something, hundreds of thousands of people will take, and of course, it's never specified never what, the, what pledge the pledge is. <laughs> but you're just taking taking the pledge is the thing. Yeah. Now, I think yeah. the takeaway from all this is we got to, you know, we got to quote Mike Ehrmantraut here and say, "No more half measures, Walter." That's right. No more yes. half measures. Yeah, yeah. And I, I will say this before we move on to just one more thing. Um, oh, great. I, I, I do thought, think yeah. that uh, you, looking at this, the reason that um, I am optimistic and I end this with a, a, a good taste in my mouth is because of the fact that, like, if ever there was a sign that um, the PR battle is all but lost for Israel, it's the fact that um, there was nothing, nothing at the Oscars. Um, that was purely just about uh, October 7th and about, um, you know, pro-Israel. Like, think right. about the Oscars after 9-11, right? Sure, um, yep. like, uh, Like, think about the Oscars after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Think yep. about the amount of stuff that people had to say, the amount of grandstanding. 100%. The amount of, you know, it's wild to realize. Yeah. There was more explicit October 7th propaganda at a recent U2 concert in Las Vegas. <laughs> yeah. Than yes. there was at the Academy Awards. Yes, and, and they sang a song. Have we played that on this podcast? Have you no, that? but uh, I, I, not, I didn't know about that. I would love to play. That. I'll send it to you. Um, yeah, it's like it, it, I, I look at that and I say, like, this is, um, you know, not only was he not booed for that speech, but he was cheered for it. He, there were yes, people who were scared to cheer. Absolutely, that's right. But he was, he did get a round of applause, and um, I think that, like, I look at that as like a pure. PR battle loss, like the 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 fact that liberal Hollywood, like, d did not like they just pretended it didn't happen. 
They and and that's the big reason the Hezbollahs are mad. It's because the only statement that mentions October seventh is the same statement that says you are using our Jewishness and the Holocaust to justify your um, aggression and you know occupation and all that stuff. And I'm like, to me, I'm like that that is that is wild how much goodwill was squandered by Israel. It's wild that they that they even let him one because they could have known he was going to do that. I, I think oh, yeah. he's made public statements. The funniest uh, refutation mm-hmm. of his uh, of his speech, I forget it was Anlon Levy or which or one of Noah these. Noah Tishby, punks. maybe. It's now it was a, it was a guy mm-hmm. who said something like, "The zone of in- oh, no, it was Ben Shapiro, of maybe course. something <laughs> like the zone of interest is a film in which you there are no Jews." Uh, th- those are the only kinds of Jews that matter to Jonathan Glazer, the invisible right. ones, the ones Jewish suffering. So he takes the like very bold and I think extremely effective artistic choice that's yes. at the central conceit of that film, yeah. which is that you're on the outskirts of Auschwitz yes. at the home of its commander and yes. his, his, you know, gardening happy wife and their miserable empty lives that's only filled with their power and privilege. And it's actually a very human look at dehumanization of the oppressor. And meanwhile, the oppressed are just a rumor. They're just right. They're just that's a like wisp the point of, of smoke. The fucking the, movie. That's the fucking point of it. And he <laughs> takes this as like, ah, this guy wanted to erase the Jews. It's as if there were no Jews killed in the Holocaust. This is like anti-art. Like you just I love yeah. that. I saw someone else tweet, this is some nobody, but it was like someone tweeted like uh, the, this isn't a movie about Jews. This is a movie about Nazis. Yeah, yeah. like uh, essentially saying, you know, um, the, people keep calling this a, uh, a movie about, you know, a Jewish director who made a movie about Jews and blah. No, it's a it's a movie about Nazis, as if, <laughs> as if it's somehow <laughs> about how Nazis are good. <laughs> well, but that's but that's the real. That's, I think that's deep. What they're deeply uncomfortable with, actually, yes. is to watch to watch that movie. They have to face yes. what Nazis actually are. They're yes. not. They're not a slick villain played by Ray yes. Fiennes in Schindler's List, which was a great performance. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Well-written character, you know. Mm-hmm. They are boring. Yes. Bureaucrats. They are moving pieces around on a chessboard. They are doing their job. They are going home to their wives. They are serving powers much bigger than them. They're worrying about promotions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They are banal as banal can be, and yeah. it's very uncomfortable to see that because it disrupts the narrative of angels and demons that we yes. need to hold on to if we're going to use the Holocaust to justify what Israel's doing, 100%. and it forces us to look in the mirror at, we're all kind of like that, yes, in a way. Yes. You no, know? I, that, I think that's exactly right. It's like we've, we've moved, watching a movie in which Nazis aren't portrayed as almost like this like uh superhuman evil like w- w- once in a century or once in a generation or once in a millennia uh devil people sprouted from the ground who came up just to do murder with their pitchforks and their fork tails and so it's like <laughs> no sh- sh- showing them as people who uh you could see you know it's like you can see people uh, in your own life including yourself being like lulled into this bureaucratic form of complete, um, I mean, in the, yeah, industrialized it, assembly line mass murder. Now, but when you yeah. say we say once in a century, once in a lifetime. Now, my, I'm going to I'm doing an alternate version of the Talking Heads song. Once in a lifetime, <laughs> you may find yourself living in a beautiful house with a beautiful wife on the outskirts of a concentration camp, <laughs> and may you you may say to yourself. Well, which crematoria should I install? <laughs> this Letting is not my zone of interest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. That has been, I think that's an episode of Bad Hasbara. What do you think? That has been Hasbara. That has been Bara. Uh, <laughs> thanks, been Bara. everyone, for listening. Daniel, thank you so much again. For being being my co-host, uh, I, I I love you, dog. I love you, cat. <laughs> oh hell, hell yeah, fuck yeah. Uh, do yeah. you want to uh, plug anything? Nah, I'm uh, every, everything's everything's good and plugged. But you know, find me in the usual spots. Fuck yeah. If find you want him. more nonsense, yeah. If you want more nonsense, follow, find him in the spots. You know where he be. Uh, all right. 
badhasbar at gmail.com for all your questions, comments, and concerns. Uh, and what else? Uh, we got patreon.com slash badhasbar. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. And until next time, from the river to the sea, wearing a red pin is not enough for me. <laughs> Sorry.